When Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, was approaching his deathbed, many worried about how power could properly transition to a new man after he had held it for so long. Augustus's position within the Roman state was unprecedented, and many legitimately wondered if it could last in the hands of anyone else. Luckily for Rome, the inheritor of Augustus's position was Tiberius, 55 years old and an experienced Roman general. As far as the legions of the Senate, there were no complaints. Upon delivering a fine funeral oration in reverence of the dead Augustus, Tiberius was hailed as princeps, meaning first citizen, by the assembled senators of Rome. The soldiers in the provinces swiftly declared their loyalty to the new emperor. Interestingly, Tiberius was overly hesitant when receiving the senate's honors, and he denied the titles of Augustus, meaning revered one, and pater patriae, meaning father of the fatherland. This would set the tone for his reign, which was marked by his personal disengagement from politics and imperial administration. Tiberius was born on the 16th of November, 42 BCE. His father was Tiberius Claudius Nero, and his mother was Livia Drusilla. He was a blue-blooded noble, and as he was growing up, the young Octavian was waging the final round of Roman civil wars. When Tiberius was just three years old, his family experienced quite the shakeup. Octavian had met his mother Livia at a social gathering, and the two couldn't get enough of each other. Octavian forced Tiberius Claudius to divorce Livia, and the two were married in January of 38 BCE. Livia also soon gave birth to Tiberius's biological brother, Drusus. When Tiberius's biological father died in 33 BCE, the two young boys were transferred to Octavian and Livia's household. Tiberius would grow up under the shadow of the future emperor of Rome. Livia raised her children well, instilling in them a spirit of ambition and making them tough. As they grew up, both received accelerated tracks to attaining political office and secured prestigious military appointments. However, Tiberius's life was marred with tragedy family instability, the death of his father, and a stepfather who always seemed to favor other men over him. First it was Marcellus, then his brother Drusus was the favored child until he died on campaign in Germany. Then it was the brothers Gaius and Lucius that received pride of place. On top of this, Tiberius was forced to divorce his happy marriage and marry Augustus' daughter Julia, who never loved him and cheated on him often. Tiberius got fed up with all of this and left public life for exile. All of Augustus's other men ended up dead, forcing him to recall Tiberius from exile. It was a bitter, scarred, and reluctant man who assumed the full responsibility of the imperial title. He had to play politics with everyone, establish good relations with the nobles and the people and the army, answer letters and deal with administration, manage the money, handle religious services, be a charismatic leader, and deal with every issue the empire faced. It was a burden that could have overwhelmed anyone. From the start, Tiberius made mistakes. He was not an approachable or friendly man, which strained his relationships with the senators. When he tried to give them more freedom to operate, they deferred to him instead, leaving him to regard them as men fit to be slaves. His callous attitude and closed off nature led to much derision and whisperings among the senators. Eventually he decided he had had enough, and created a court to prosecute those who disgraced the honor of the imperial office. Dozens of senators were executed through these trials, earning Tiberius, despite all his attempts at leniency, the eternal moniker of tyrant. By all accounts, Tiberius was at least adept with public relations, sponsoring the right amounts of free grain supply and circuses for the people while being a frugal spender and ensuring a budget surplus. However, by 26, he was pretty much burned out with the exhausting business of dealing with arrogant senators on top of everything else. At the age of 68, he withdrew to his villa on the island of Capri in the Bay of Naples. He would never return to Rome. In his absence, Rome was effectively under the control of the commander of the Imperial Praetorian Guard, Lucius Sejanus. 
Tiberius trusted him a little too much, and he exercised his authority very strictly on the city of Rome, particularly on the senatorial classes. Sejanus continued and expanded Tiberius' persecutions of seditious senators, executing hundreds for speaking out against Tiberius, and against him personally. It is unclear how much of this was Sejanus, and how much was done on Tiberius' orders. The prefect was finally brought down when Antonia the Younger, the niece of Augustus, informed Tiberius of a conspiracy by Sejanus to seize power. Tiberius had Sejanus executed in 31, but his appointed successor killed even more senators, this time killing the former supporters of the now disgraced Praetorian prefect. Tiberius died in 37. He was 77 years old and had ruled Rome for 22 years. No one missed him. However, he has been somewhat misjudged by history. The biased histories of senatorial historians like Suetonius claim that he engaged in salacious pedophilia at his villa on Capri. But these accusations can be safely disregarded as senseless slander. In reality, he was modest, refusing great honors and luxury. He was a sensible administrator, taking a great deal of time to correspond with provincial governors on matters of state. He finally secured the Roman policy of consolidation over conquest, ensuring that Rome could survive within its borders. He left the empire with a sizable surplus of gold and a stable economy. All this, as well as the stability his 22 years on the throne provided, is far more than most emperors of Rome could say. Caligula. I'm sure you've heard about him. Namely that he was insane, deranged, bloodthirsty, and nearly destroyed Rome. This is true, but it's also not. Caligula was born Gaius Julius Caesar on the 31st of August, 12 CE. He was the first emperor who had never known a world not dominated by Augustus and his legacy. The name Caligula was actually a nickname he got as a boy. The word Caligae referred to military boots, and the soldiers gave little Gaius the nickname Caligula, or Little Boots, because he would always run around the camp in boots. In his time, he was always called by his first name, Gaius. Upon his ascension to the throne in 37, he was the most popular emperor ever. The people came out and cheered for him on the streets for hours, and even foreign heads of state expressed their thanks that a young and healthy princeps was to be the ruler of Rome. Caligula embraced and encouraged all of this admiration, lavishing funds upon circuses, games, and public works projects. The Senate, the army, and the people all loved Caligula. So what happened to make him a contender for worst Roman emperors ever? To get the indisputable facts out of the way first, Caligula was reckless and young. He spent too much and too often, even giving away money for free to the poor. The people greatly appreciated this, of course, but it served to wipe out the budget surplus of Tiberius and destabilize the economy. Caligula was also dismissive and intolerant of the Senate, to a degree that Tiberius could never match. He constantly mocked the aristocratic arrogance of the senators, did everything he could to emasculate and humiliate them, and eventually started executing hundreds of them on the basis of conspiracy. To be fair, many of those senators were plotting to kill him. However, they would not have gotten to that point had Caligula not ruled like a complete and total tyrant, consulting them on nothing, and even appointing his horse as a consul as a cruel joke. Many have cited that as a sign of his insanity, but it was more likely a harsh stab at the Senate's impotent state, as in, you are so useless that my horse can be a consul, and nothing will change. The histories claim that Caligula was depraved, liked to watch violence, treated his family members horribly, and engaged in incest with his sisters. I don't believe these accusations, nor do many modern historians. There is no evidence for them, and they sound just like the equally unfounded accusations made against Tiberius. I think Caligula was just an arrogant, spoiled rich kid who loved the easy popularity he got from the people, hated the pretentious old heads in the Senate, and got drunk on power due to his inexperience and inability to handle such massive responsibility. It all had to end at some point. And it did in 41, just four years after his rise. Caligula was assassinated, stabbed to death by a conspiracy of senators, other nobles, and the Praetorian Guard. Interestingly, the people of Rome mourned his death harder than they had anyone else in living memory. 
as did the armies in the provinces and the dignitaries of foreign states. Caligula's successor was someone the Praetorians found hiding behind a curtain in the imperial palace, cowering in fear and trying not to be seen. Claudius was born Tiberius Claudius on the 1st of August, 10 BCE. His father was Drusus, brother of the Emperor Tiberius, and his mother was Antonia, daughter of Mark Antony. From an early age, it became apparent that Claudius was disabled. He walked with a limp, was slightly deaf, and had a stutter. All of this earned him a lot of hatred and dismissal, even from his own family. His own mother reportedly referred to him as a model of ineptitude and disability. Even as Claudius became an adult, acquired respectable professions as an orator and historian, and sought public office numerous times, he was always turned down. No one, not even the paranoid Caligula, considered him a real contender for power. This is likely why Claudius was able to survive Caligula's persecutions. No one expected him to become anything. So now crippled Claudius, shunned all his life, was emperor. How was this going to turn out? Claudius managed to perform beyond pretty much everyone's expectations. He was certainly the best emperor since Augustus, and he had many virtues that others didn't really appreciate. He was judicious, fully embracing the emperor's legal role and personally providing over as many court cases as he could manage and always delivering just rulings. He ordered expansion of Roman borders for the first time since Augustus. Judea, Thrace, Noricum, and Mauritania were brought under direct Roman rule, and Britannia, the land that Caesar had failed to conquer a century earlier, was finally subjugated by Claudius' generals. Claudius sponsored public works projects and public entertainment, including a wild spectacle in which Claudius himself personally fought a killer whale. He loved public games and always made himself visible to the people. Perhaps more importantly though, Claudius sponsored dozens of Roman colonies in newly incorporated territory. This was crucial in transforming what used to be conquered land into Roman domain, slowly bringing Roman identity to all Roman subjects. Claudius, however, drew the same accusations of tyranny that Tiberius and Caligula had previously. He was similar to Tiberius in that he first tried to defer to the senators, but was discouraged by their reticent and dependent natures. For efficiency's sake, he just did everything himself without much formality, leading to several plots on his life and forcing him to start limited persecutions. This, just like his predecessors, unfairly tarnished his historical reputation. Claudius was a great emperor, intelligent, conscientious, and wise. He was popular with the people, but unlike Caligula before him, he was also smart with money, modest with power, and prudent in all regards. He died in 54. He was 63 years old and had ruled Rome for 13 years. His successor was another one of those names that still summons images of infamy and terror. Nero was born Lucius Domitius Ahanabarbus on the 15th of December, 37. His mother was Agrippina the Younger, an independent and strong-willed political figure. When he was adopted by Claudius and rose to the throne at the young age of 16, his mother and a cadre of advisors took much of the real responsibility. The first few years of Nero's reign saw little of his input on public policy. His mother Agrippina held de facto power, but Nero increasingly came to resent this, particularly when his mother disapproved of him having an affair, but more generally because she was overbearing and still treated him like a child. Their split grew increasingly wide and deep, with Agrippina being exiled from the palace, but still holding influence. The sources are conflicted on the happenings of the event, but it seems likely that Nero played some role in his mother's death in 59. After the death of Agrippina, Nero began moving away from the conservative administration led by his advisors and taking more personal initiative in governance. In 62, Nero turned on the Senate, 
after deferring to his autonomy for years, executing dissidents and rivals. He also began another lavish spending campaign, mostly focusing on public works and public entertainment. Interestingly, some modern historians have supposed that Nero's spending was an attempt to stimulate the Roman economy in a time of known deflation and economic stagnation. This idea is supported by Nero's devaluation of Roman currency. In any case, the money he lavished on entertainment and building projects made him immensely popular with the people of Rome. It is important to realize that Nero's reign is relayed to us by incredibly biased senatorial historians, and taking their accounts at face value is a bad idea. In 64, a massive fire, often called the Great Fire of Rome, struck the city, destroying massive areas of buildings and raging for over a week. Ancient speculation was that Nero had intentionally caused the fire, which is unlikely. And even more unlikely is the myth that he fiddled while Rome burned, as the fiddle did not exist in his time. In fact, Nero was active on the scene during and after the fire, opening his palaces to shelter the homeless and increasing the free food handouts. Unfortunately, Nero's other actions in the aftermath of the fire did little to absolve his guilt. He used much of the cleared land to construct a massive palace for himself, so impressively luxurious that it was called the Domus Aurea, or Golden House. Completing his self-centered quest for vainglory was a massive statue of himself, called the Colossus of Nero. However, this was not the whole story. Nero rebuilt much of the destroyed city under an improved and standardized urban plan, replacing narrow roads with wide boulevards and instituting building codes to prevent the devastation of future fires. However, to pay for these rebuilding efforts along with all of his other expenditures, Nero was forced to raise taxes, which caused resentment from the provinces. This would be his downfall. In March of 68, a general in Gaul went into revolt. Although he was defeated, another usurper named Galba rose in revolt in Hispania. Nero's position became hopeless once the Praetorian Guard defected and declared allegiance to Galba, leaving him without protection. And so, Nero was forced to meet his ignominious end. Death by the side of the road from a bleeding throat, having ordered a personal slave to kill him. Men sent by the Senate caught up with him just before he died, and tried to save him, but to no avail. He bled out. With him, the dynasty of the Julio-Claudians, which at first started with the great Julius Caesar, and the even greater Caesar Augustus, came to an end. The Julio-Claudians had had a great reformer, a stable tyrant, an unstable tyrant, a wise and just ruler, and an immature demagogue. The dynasty met its end not in a peaceful transition of power, but with yet another plunge into the fires of civil war. Its last ruler died not peacefully in his bed at an old age, but as a young man in his prime stabbed by a slave, struggling with a slashed throat against those trying to save him, crying out and choking on his own blood. You are too late. This is destiny. <laughs>